Hello and welcome to today's edition of FNR Ask the Expert. Today we're going to be talking about planning and resources for conservation tree planting. So we're joined by Lenny Farley, who's one of our Purdue Extension Foresters, and also Carrie Pike, who is a forest regeneration specialist with the USDA Forest Service in the Eastern Region. She's based here in West Lafayette, Indiana, thankfully as well. Um, so today we're going to talk about everything about conservation tree planting. What is it? How do you do it? Where do you get the plants? Um, everything you need to know. So if you have any questions throughout the broadcast today, um, put those in the comment section here on Facebook and we will have Lenny and Carrie answer those throughout. So before we get started, Carrie, can you kind of just explain to us what a forest regeneration specialist with the Forest Service does and a little bit about what, what you guys do um, in regards to conservation tree planting? Yes, we'll do. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so I work for state and private forestry which is the branch of the Forest Service that does not do research and we don't manage forests. We work with partners and tech transfer. And so my background is in forest genetics and tree improvement. And specifically, I work for the RINGER program and RNGR, it's an acronym for Reforestation, Nursery and Genetic Resources. And the RINGER team is a national team. We cover all 50 states plus the US territories. I'm one of about five people on the team. We cover, we provide technical expertise related to nurseries and genetics. And we have a website that has a lot of information about our program, but we have thousands of publications on there as well at rngr.net. And so you can find descriptions of the program. You can find nursery manuals that we have produced that have served as an industry standard for containerized nurseries. And most recently, the hardwood nursery guide was just placed up there. We also published Tree Planters Notes, which is a really nice publication that is put out twice annually. And all of the uh, editions of Tree Planters Boat Notes back to the 1950s are archived at the Ringer website. So that about covers it, Wendy. Well, thanks for that brief introduction. Um, happy to have you with us today and looking forward to hearing about your expertise. So Lenny, get us a little bit started on this topic. What is exactly conservation tree planting and how is that different from me just going to the nursery and tossing a new tree in my yard? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And at the simplest level, it's really thinking about reestablishing or planting a forest or woodland. And so we're doing a planting for conservation purposes. And what that also oftentimes means is we're utilizing native species to the area that we're planting. And we're utilizing uh, uh, seedling sources or seed sources that come from native areas. So we could think of it as uh, a wild sourced or woods run uh, seedlings as we might say. And, and so we, we counter kind of compare that then to uh, ornamental uh, urban or landscape plantings where we're planting primarily for aesthetic purposes, although we get a lot of other uh, environmental benefits from those plantings. And we're oftentimes utilizing uh, special cultivars or even clones of particularly selected trees that provide very specific benefits, oftentimes aesthetic benefits. So that's really kind of the best comparison I can give. Uh, and I think Carrie's got some additional information on uh, some of the particular objectives and uh, uh, some of the considerations for those types of plantings. Yeah, when we, you can have a lot of different objectives that would meet, that would still require conservation type of seedlings that the purpose of these plantings is you're just trying to mimic the natural genetics of a, stand, of a natural stand as opposed to planting clones that um, don't have the genetic diversity. But you can have multiple objectives that would meet this, such as you may be trying to control erosion. It may be aesthetics, as Lenny pointed out. You may have a wildlife planting. You may be just trying to convert an abandoned agricultural field to a forest. But all of these types of uses would benefit from uh, seedlings that have genetic variation that is natural and would kind of form a natural woodlot that is uh, something recognizable in the state. And something adapted to, we'll talk a little bit more probably about like where the seed should, co should come from, but the purpose of planting native seedlings is that they're gonna be adapted to your local conditions as opposed to cultivars that are selected from one particular site. 
And so you want something that comes from not too far from where you're planting it. In trees, it's actually that not too far is bigger than you might think. Smaller plants in restoration, they try to keep them close to home, but the rule of thumb is generally 100 miles north to south, maybe 200 miles east to west. Uh, don't go further than that for seed, which is why we tend to look for nurseries that are not you know, within our state because they tend to procure seed from within the state. That's great information. So don't be, you know, looking on the internet and just purchasing random seeds from wherever you happen to find them. Right. Um, and Lenny also gave us a great resource, which is in the comments section here about planting forest trees and shrubs in the state of Indiana. It's a great extension publication that will give you um, a, further, a further look into kind of some of the in-state um, resources. And obviously you can find those um, if you're not in the state of Indiana and with your, within your local extension offices, most states have those. Um, and if not, your local DNR or conservation office should have resources um, similar to that as well. So let's get a little bit into what we're talking about planting here. Um, what are some of the different types of um, plantings that I might be considering for conservation? Well, why don't, yep, yeah, let's look at the slideshow. Um, you're really looking at there's two main types of plant material that you can purchase. So if you think of all the plant material, we can kind of divide into two types. There's containerized seedlings and there are bare root seedlings. And the containerized are grown, as you can see, in small containers. And the bare root are grown in large nursery beds. And the difference is that the containerized are sold with the soil on them. The bare root is sold with the roots exposed. And so there are implications you can if you're handling that bare root stock type, you have to be careful. They can't, you have to keep them moist. You don't want to hold them too long. You want to get them in the ground quickly. Something in a container can, has a little bit more longer shelf life. So let's look at the next one. There's some more other nursery jargon that gets used sometimes. Sometimes nurseries will refer to a seedling type as a 1-0. All that means is it's been grown one year. The O part refers to the occasion where something might be planted. They may do a transplant where they'll grow something in a plug like these little seedlings. They might pull it out of the, a nursery might take it out and then put it into a bare root bed and then it gets called a transplant, like a one-one transplant. And that just means it's been a year in a pot and a year in a nursery bed. That's all that means. So if you hear one O, it just means it's one year old. So you can have two O stock and three O stock as well. So this picture, that picture was showing southern pines. And this one is showing hardwood. So you can grow conifers, like pines are often grown in little containers. They all are also grown as bare root. Hardwoods can be grown both ways, more commonly bare root, but here are some one-year-old red maples in a styro block. And a styro block is just another type of container. And if you were to buy these seedlings, they would probably come, they'd probably pull them out and wrap them up and you'd probably just get them in a box. And these are some two-year-old tamaracks. This is me, this was actually part of a research trial. Uh, these, so these would be called 2-0 stock. And you can see about the size. Conifers, like your pines and your spruces, they tend to be sold as two or three-year-old stock. They're a little slower to grow in the beginning, whereas hardwoods, many of our hardwood species grow really fast. Like if you buy a walnut from in the state of Indiana, it's gonna be a one year old bare root and it's gonna be very big. So they have they very different sizes when they're small. The conifers tend to be a little smaller. So they tend to be two or three year old stock versus a hardwood that may be a one or a two year old stock. So also you need to think about the size of the containers uh, these are some maples. They're probably three to five years old. I'm actually not sure. This is at a private nursery. And you have to remember, if you're going to get a larger tree like this, you're going to have to haul it to the site and you're going to have to dig a hole. That's probably what, Lenny, one and a half times the size of the pot. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. You need to be oversized. That's right. Yeah. There are advantages to bigger stock, of course. If you've got the space, if you've got the if, you're, if you don't mind hauling them around and you don't mind digging a bigger hole, they get above the competition in weeds more quickly. The smaller seedlings will need more protection. So there are different size pots. So ask your nursery, manage the person you speak to at the nursery, if it's a pot, how big is the pot? And this is about like a one or two gallon pot, I would say. 
And then the next one is a similar size pod, it's probably a three-year-old beach plum, but you can see the shape of the trees or the shrubs will vary. And so you need to ask the nursery, you know, how tall is it? And they're gonna give you the height from the ground to the top of the tree. And then you gotta think, can I transport that? Can I carry that pot around? How many do I need? That sort of thing. So ask them how big it is. These are, this is really big stock type. This is, I don't actually know how old it is. I was guessing maybe a five-year tulip poplar. Uh, very big pots, big tall trees. So that's a big commitment. You're probably not gonna plant many of these. You may go with smaller stock, but again, if you have a need, a woodland, you've got the ability to haul this stuff around and you can dig a big enough hole you may want to go with bigger stock to keep it away from the deer. And then, and these are biggest, these are probably five gallon pails, I'm guessing, maybe bigger. So they can get quite big. And most of these potted plants are grown, all the potted plants I've shown you, the bigger ones are grown at private nurseries, bare root seedlings and the smaller containers may be grown at private or state nurseries. So, Lenny, I'm going to ask you, I know we've talked in, in the past a lot about deer brows and protecting plants and deer fencing and, um, you know, should I put a, a little fence around my seedlings? Does that determine maybe a little bit which of these, how old or how large of a plant you want to go with? Maybe you can avoid having to do some of those additional um, things we've talked about in the past. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Wendy. So uh, buying taller stock does give you an advantage in two ways. It's got an established root system in that container. And so it's got the potential to take off and grow a little faster than bare root stock does sometimes. And if you've got a, a plant that is more than five or six feet tall, you may have put the top bud out of the reach of the browsing of the deer. And so you've actually got an opportunity to get that, that plant above the competition of the deer. But as Carrie mentioned, there's a logistic aspect and also a cost aspect of this too. The, the larger stock you select to plant, typically the fewer you're planting. Uh, and so what I think is a good use of these is perhaps in a mix uh, where you're gonna get natural regeneration, like in a forest opening or a bottomland situation, or perhaps where you're gonna plant it with lower cost bare root stock of species that maybe aren't quite as attractive to the deer. And so these would be kind of those target plants you want to absolutely make sure make it through. Uh, and it's a situation where you could use that in the place of plant uh, using fencing, perhaps, uh, where fencing just isn't practical or, or uh, economical to do. Thanks, Lenny. Just wanted to clarify for some of those who've seen some of our past broadcasts and are trying to figure out if they need to go and purchase that fencing or not. Um, so Carrie, I'll toss it back to you if you want to talk a little bit about more about the bare root stock and continue with the slideshow. Yeah, just quickly, bare root stock are grown in these nursery beds. They tend to be very sandy so sites, the nursery beds, so that the soil doesn't cling to the roots. And this is what they look like. Not a lot of folks get to actually see them. If they purchase, they may have their, their seedlings shipped to them. So this is what they look like. And you can go to the next slide, Lenny. And so Lenny, I think, I'm not sure, this is showing what two seedlings plucked out of a bare root bed might look like. Um, the roots can be bigger, but they're definitely bigger than those little plugs that I showed you of the longleaf pine earlier. So you have to think that you've got to dig bigger holes for them sometimes, but they can grow very well, even though the roots are exposed if you handle them properly. Don't let them dry out, uh, get them planted as soon as you get them in your hands. Don't let them sit very long. One of the things this also shows is, is some of the differences in nursery practice. Uh, this is two-year-old uh, pecan and a lot of times we grow pecan to 2-0 because it doesn't grow very fast and get very big the first year uh, and a lot of nurseries uh, in the hardwood area are doing undercutting and so during the growing season they'll prune the taproot off and if they get that taproot pruned at the right time and get some water back on it, a lot of times they get really nice lateral root development, which provides perhaps a better adapted seedling for outplanting. And so the seedling on the left, not many lateral roots. The seedling on the right, a really nice number of lateral roots. It's probably gonna make that, that plant a lot more competitive. Mm -hmm. 
So if you're purchasing from a nursery, you don't always see the containers and sometimes they're shipped in large boxes like these in, in, um, in Arkansas, there's a plastic bag in each one and the seedlings are piled in the bag. The bag is closed when it's put in a box. So for large orders, like those can hold a lot of seedlings. They make it shipped in boxes. And the next slide shows there are other ways too that they're shipped depending on the nursery sometimes they can ship them it depends they have each nursery has a relationship with their shipping company and they may get shipped with the green side sticking out one end sticking out another end sticking out both ends or not or covered so they can be shipped in a variety of of ways but if they're bare root you do need to take good care of them and make sure they get planted as soon shortly after they arrive so out planting so one of the uh, questions people ask oftentimes is what kind of tools and equipment do I need to do this conservation tree planting? And a good stout shovel actually will do a fine job. Uh, nothing wrong with using a shovel to create a hole that's deep enough to accommodate the root system, wide enough to be able to spread those lateral roots out, and then just use your personal horsepower to get those seedlings in the ground and covered back up. However, if you've got quite a few seedlings to plant, a lot of folks prefer to go to a purpose-built uh, tree planting tool. And we've got some examples here. The one on the far right, or pardon me, far left, is uh, called the hodad. And this is a tool that is used to essentially sling down like a, a large hoe. It's, you can see it's got a very long, broad blade. You plunge it into the soil, pull it back, and you've created a space to pop your bare root seedling or even a small containerized seedling in the ground. Uh, this I think is best suited oftentimes for slightly lighter, finer textured soils, sands and sandy loams. If it's a really heavy clay, sometimes it can be tough to get a, a good depth uh, push with this and, and open a nice big hole. The uh, tree planting tool I see used a lot for hand planting the hardwoods here in Indiana is the one on the center and the right, and that's the KBC bar. And this is a nice heavy uh, foot powered tree planting tool that's got a wedge at the bottom about a foot long and so provides a nice wide and pretty deep hole that we can typically get our hardwood uh, seedlings into uh, and use that to then punch it in back of the original hole about three or four inches to close the original hole and we can do a lot of planting over the period of a day with those tools. We're all about work harder, not smart, or smarter, not harder around here, right? Yeah, and that and that's kind of brings us to the next photo. And so if if you've got a few hundred trees to plant and you've got a good back or, uh, uh, you know, labor in the form of kids or friends that you're willing to feed, uh, tree planting bars uh, and shovels may be your way. Uh, or if you've got a site that you can't get equipment on, uh, that's the other reason to use the tree planting bars or the hodad. But if you've got a nice open site, like an old ag field, an area that was pasture in the past that you could get a tractor across, and you have a lot of trees to plant, like several thousand, it's probably time to think about getting a contractor out there, uh, either a consulting forester or uh, there are some con contracting tree planters that have equipment to put those seedlings in the ground. And so these tree planting machines uh, hooked up to tractors are designed for bare root planting uh, but they can do a very good job. A good experienced crew on an open field can put in several thousand trees in a day where most hand planters were looking at three or 400 trees and you got to ask yourself how many days in a row can you do that? Uh, so uh, with large tree plantings, oftentimes this is the best route to take. And then the other issue with tree planting is, is weed control. And so when we stick these little trees in the ground, uh, we're either taking them out of their container or we pulled them out of the nursery beds. And there's always a little bit of shock to the system there. Plus we're oftentimes going into a location where weeds and grasses could grow vigorously. And so what we typically recommend folks do is the season before you actually plan to plant your trees, start working on site preparation. So get rid of perennial brush and weeds in the locations where you want to plant your trees that provide a, a less competitive environment. And you can use tillage, herbicides, or a combination to prepare your site the season of planting. Uh, make sure that you've got 
pretty good clean ground. It's a lot easier to plant on an area that's been prepped almost like you were gonna put crops into it if you're gonna do machine planting. And then we recommend doing weed control around these seedlings for two to three seasons after planting. And what that does is provide them with a competitive advantage over these aggressive growing weeds and grasses. Uh, lets them get a root system established, build a, a little bit of leaf area and provide an opportunity to really get started and get established on the site. And if you have questions about how to do those things, the publications that Wendy mentioned and also some uh, references to professional foresters that I'm gonna get to, uh, those folks are good places to go to give you the detailed information to do that kind of work. So this is definitely not a set it and forget it <laughs> type of thing. We, we, this is gonna take some, some effort to get your, your trees the way that you want them. Yeah, if you want success, uh, you've got to pay attention to some details. And uh, Carrie, I'm, uh, th these are your slides, so I'm going to let you kind of talk about these situations here. Yeah, th so these are interesting. That The photo on the left is showing, it's actually a research plot in northern Minnesota, and it's showing a bur oak was planted. But you notice there wasn't, it wasn't sprayed, the tree, you can't really see it. It's kind of, because it, it was leaf off season. But, you know, in a natural setting like that, where you're not going to get a ton of weeds growing around, just some native vegetation, this, the site prep may be limited. Uh, but on an old agricultural field, we have lots of bluegrass and things that create these mats. You you will need to do something. And this site, the picture on the right, you can kind of see in the, on the bottom of the photo. There's a little there's a vec, one of those Vexar tubes. And so in this case, they obviously haven't sprayed up and down the rows, or you'd see kind of bare ground. But instead, you can see there there are other ways if you're not going to use herbicide to protect the trees. If you have a site like this where there's a lot of grass and a lot of weed competition, um, if you can't create that that drip line space, you can use Vexar tubes or other type of, uh, they have other types of tubing to keep, protect them from either deer brows or in this case, it's not so much the deer brows, it's just keeping it protected from the competition. And in some extreme cases that you put a whole fence up, this is an extreme case, this is a research plot. And um, in some cases it may be worth your while if you've got a lot invested in the site to keep the deer out, if deer are a problem in your area. And deer sometimes are a problem and sometimes they're not, but a tall fence is needed in at least the Northern parts of the world to keep the deer out at least eight foot. And this particular fence is a soft plastic, which is great as a short-term fence. Uh, some places you might need, you know, you may need to invest in, in a heavier duty fence made of like steel hardware cloth or something. And we have some great resources um, in the comment section there that Lenny and um, also Brian McGowan, one of our other, other extension specialists have put together um, in showing you how to protect whether that's one single seedling or like you mentioned, Carrie, the, the deer fencing that's needed. Um, so feel free to look at those. Before we get too far um, into this, if you, again, if you have any questions, throw those in the comment section on Facebook, we're live so that you can interact with us and get questions from, answered from the experts. So please put those in the comment section. Um, we'd love to uh, answer your questions. Um, as we wait for more questions, I'm gonna kind of let's move, move along here. So we've talked about, you know, the types of plantings I might get and maybe some of the things to plant, that I need to plant them, but what exactly am I planting and what should I be planting? Um, as I look for conservation. Um, if one of you wants to start tackling that. I'll give that one to Lenny. Okay, yeah, uh, I, I did this for years as a district forester. And so we've got to combine a couple of things when we think about what to plant. The first thing that we've got to find out are what kind of soils and site conditions do you have? Because that's going to dictate what species of trees and shrubs will be adapted to that site. And so we start our palette of our painting for our tree planting with that first set of information. And then along with that, we need to bring in, what are your objectives for your planting? And so if you've got a strong wildlife management objective, we wanna think about trees and shrubs that are gonna favor those wildlife species that you have interest in, either through food or cover. If you're interested in growing timber trees, we're thinking about what trees are gonna match your site, make good development, but also have good timber markets in the area. Same thing with windbreaks, recreation, aesthetics, all those things can be thought about uh, and one of the most important things I can tell you to do is to get some professional advice and assistance. Uh, so you want to consult a forester, 
to help you decide what are really the best plants to plant on your site based on your site and your objectives. And so we've got a resource here, uh, findindianaforester.org that can direct you to uh, private sector foresters. You can also contact, if you're Indiana, the Indiana Division of Forestry, or if you're in another state, your forestry agency, and they can direct you to people who can give you direction. Um, the, uh, the other resource that I'm gonna direct you to that I think Wendy's gonna be able to put up here is the web soil survey. And so we talked about your site. Uh, you can actually go on this online tool and find your site uh, on a map and then draw a, a boundary around. It's called an area of interest. Uh, you essentially draw the boundary around where you want to plant or what you want to find out the soils on. And you can pull up soils maps and even tree planting recommendations and suitabilities for certain trees like black walnut. And so it's a great tool to utilize to get an idea of what might be suitable for planting on your site. Because we definitely don't want to plant something that's not going to grow or be suitable for what we Those want. Those are long-term right. mistakes. That's right. Yeah. And Why waste the money? <laughs> right. You can also look around at your neighbors and see other landforms to get an idea of what micro there, but you really should have the soils checked because you could have uh, some strange soils that will impact the trees. But you can get an idea of what will grow there by just looking around what's growing on your neighbor's property or similar types of land in your area. And while we're on the subject, Lenny, I know this is a big push for you guys and also for the US Forest Service is planting natives. We wanna make sure that we're not um, bringing in invasive species. I know they may look pretty and I know we've had this conversation before, um, but definitely that's something we wanna focus on to keep the habitats and to keep the native species rolling. Can you talk a little bit about that, Lenny? Yeah, if, if you're uh, getting seedlings through your state nurseries, in many cases, that's what's available is either natives or species that have pretty much shown themselves not to be invasive. Uh, from other private sources, you kind of got to be careful. Uh, you may have some offerings that could potentially cause problems in terms of becoming invasive, or as a non-native, simply aren't going to offer the level of environmental benefits that our native species do. So it's good to remember if you're thinking about wildlife, uh, reforestation, biological diversity, all these species have co-evolved together for utilizing natives. If we're bringing something in from outside, it may not have good relationships with everything else and could turn into a weed. So utilizing natives is highly recommended. And that leads us right into the next thing. Um, you do have safety within the state if you're using a state agency. So Carrie, can you Talk to us about where should I be going to get this? We've, we've talked about nurseries. We've now mentioned state nurseries. Where should I be looking um, to get the best quality um, and best plantings for my money? So you'll want to shop around a little bit. There, there are some state nurseries in some states like Indiana, but we also have, we have there are some wonderful private nurseries as well. And I would recommend that you go to the Ringer site and we have a nursery, national nursery directory, and you can type in your state and it will give you a list of all the nurseries around that sell primarily conservation grade seedlings. So it's not gonna include the pop-ups that come up in the spring selling you flowers. It'll, these are like perennial, these are nurseries that grow the kind of stock that you might need either for restoration, some of them just grow prairie plants, some of them grow trees. But I would shop around and look at, I would start in your state and then maybe expand to states adjacent because trees can be moved quite a bit and, to, and shop around and ask, you know, so you can use that, that nursery directory, get a list, figure out what species you want, and then you can start to price them out and figure out if you want bare root or if you want container and how big they are and just make a spreadsheet and then you can make an informed decision. But that, that directory is probably your best resource because it, it weeds through all of the, um, the nurseries that only sell cultivars, the majority of nurseries, if not all of them on that nursery directory will sell the type of material you're looking for, for conservation planting. And another key question is when should I be doing this? Um, when am I gonna have the best stock options from these nurseries? Um, are there some that are better to be planted at different times of year? Um, fill us in. 
So I'll start and I'll let Lenny finish because I'll have some gaps. Um, in the spring, typically the, the plantings happen in the spring when it's wet. You want to plant them when it's wet before summer. Ideally, you plant them when they're dormant, and they're not actively growing, but that can be, you know, who knows, depending on where you are, if you can even tell if they're actively growing or not. So typically in the spring, but there also are a lot of fall plantings, but I think the key is don't plant them in the middle of the summer. If you have to, for some reason, make sure they get a lot of water. Water is really the key for seedlings. So Lenny, what else, is there anything else you, that you know yeah. of? Yeah, that, that's good information, Carrie. The other thing I would say is that oftentimes there's high demand for nursery seedlings. And so it's a good idea to check with the nurseries you're interested in ordering from, yep. see when their order forms are gonna be out and to be, uh, be diligent about getting your order in ahead of time. So uh, making sure you're prepared, get your order in in place. Oftentimes they'll also offer an opportunity to put alternative species down if they can't fill your order with one species, but another is acceptable. So like you wanted white oak, but they've got bur oak and chinkapin oak. Well, I, I can take those it's a nice idea to put those second choices in because oftentimes they do sell out of species or they're in low supply because of a poor seed crop the previous year. So ordering whenever those order forms are available to make sure you're ready to go. So we have a great question just came in from Kat. And um, I know a few weeks ago, we had a, a big talk about tree inspections and some of the invasive pests that can come along with that. Um, the question she asked is, um, do nurseries from other states generally fumigate their trees? I'm concerned about spotted lantern, lantern fly and other species like that. So fumigation is, is generally limited to bare root nurseries, the nurseries that grow in these nursery beds that they use over and over and over and over and over again, uh, they, where they don't bring soil and they have to fumigate. Most every nursery has to fumigate once in a while. So the bare root nurseries generally have to, if you're buying containerized stock, they, the soil is, may have been sterilized ahead of time, or, you know, usually it's new soil. They, they don't tend to reuse their soil. Um, but I say, I would say that that's a good reason to uh, not purchase from too far away that stick within your state or maybe adjacent states to avoid transporting something accidentally. Lenny, anything else? Yeah, I agree with you, Carrie. If you can get it local, that's all the better. If you have to go outside of state, in many cases, they're required to provide some kind of what's called a phytosanitary certificate that the stock is free of insects or diseases. Uh, you could, you know, you could insist upon that if you're going to purchase from them. If they're not willing to provide it, it probably tells you that you may not want to be buying from that source. So it, it's definitely a concern. The further away we go, if there's not good inspection uh, and sanitary processes, the more likely we could have a problem. So now that we know how to avoid bringing in invasives and things like that, and we know a little bit about what to look for, um, are there some that are better than others? Um, are some gonna give me more bang for my buck or is that all based on what my goals are? Carrie, you wanna handle that? It depends on your goals. If you can handle small seedlings, they're gonna be cheaper. Uh, you'll have to watch them more closely in the beginning. So if this is a stand that you're gonna, if this is a year round home where you're planting them and you're gonna be able to keep an eye on them until they get established, then you can go with smaller stock. But if, if you can't, if maybe it's a seasonal home, uh, you may need to get bigger stock if you're not going to be able to monitor it as closely. So yes, but it's as they get bigger, they get exponentially more expensive. So a small seedling might run you a buck. Those huge seedlings that I sh we showed earlier can be several hundred dollars. And so, and I actually made a graph once and it, they go up in price exponentially. Lenny, anything else? I, I, I agree with that. And, uh, in many cases, I, I worked with bare root seedling plantings for years, and unless we had just an absolute flood or weather disaster, it was not uncommon to have 80 to 90 percent survival from those bare root seedlings if they were properly planted. Uh, our biggest threat right now seems to be deer. Uh, so uh, I, I totally agree that in many cases, one of your best bangs for the buck is bare root seedlings, and then investing in the weed control and deer protection to keep, make, keep them in good shape. Uh, just one thing I'll add in the south, they refer to the seed, the, the top of the seedling as a handle for the roots. The roots are really critically important 
And so you want a seedling that's going to have a really big, strong root system. The bigger and healthier the root system, even if the top of it doesn't look great, chances are good it will perform better. And so in the South, they, they jokingly call the, the, the green part of the seedling the handle. So keep in mind that roots are really important and root health is almost more important than the top. The top will grow. <laughs> the top will grow. If the roots are strong, the top will grow. Unless you have an insect or disease that you can see on it, that's when you, mm -hmm, when you need to be a little more careful. And that's again, when uh, finding a forester that has knowledge is going to help you a little bit. Yeah. Um, and making sure you don't pick the wrong tree. Um, are there certain species of trees, um, Lenny, especially being here in Indiana that are better suited for our area or that if maybe we'll have a better financial outcome down the road if we're looking long-term at a property? Yeah, once again, you've really got to look at your site that's going to dictate your species composition. But what we oftentimes recommend landowners that are looking for kind of broad conservation benefits like timber, and wildlife is to plant what we call the heavy seeded hardwoods. So it's things like the oaks, walnut, uh, hickory, because we find that they don't regenerate as easy, e easily naturally. Uh, there's a lot of things that have to happen right for those species to successfully regenerate. But when we look at things like black cherry and tulip tree and some of the other windblown and wildlife scattered small seeded hardwoods, they tend to propagate quite easily. So if, if I was to recommend people to plant a specific group, uh, that's the group I would look at. And the other advantage is that the oaks and walnut are our premier timber species and the oaks are our premier wildlife species. So if we're looking for real, uh, both economic and environmental bang for our buck, those are great species to plant. And we have a great uh, comment came in on our Facebook um, so they, they love their two-year bare root seedlings um, for urban forest recovery. Um, there's less transplant shock and lower water demand compared to large containerized trees. Um, is that your experience as well, Carrie and Lenny? It can be. <laughs> yeah, if they're taken care of, I think they're a, they're a fine tree to plant in a lot of cases. You just gotta be ready for those deer. <laughs> yes. Um, so now we've talked about what we can plant, where we buy it, but how do I know how many? I mean, you talked about Lenny planting thousands of trees in a day, and that just sounds like an awful lot if I, but is it determined by the acreage that I have, the type of soil I'm dealing with, um, what I hope to get out of it? Just run us through the, the numbers, if you will. Yeah, that, that's always a big issue is, is how many do I wanna put in the ground? How many can I put in the ground? So for what I would call reforestation plantings, where we're trying to recreate a new forest uh, using seedlings, and we're going to use those bare root seedlings, I'm normally recommending people plant on an eight foot by eight foot spacing, and that's 680 trees per acre. And so it kind of gets back to that hand plant versus machine plant, how good of a back do I have? Uh, but what that does, that, that tight spacing recreates a forest quite quickly put shade on the ground, it forces the trees to grow straight. We have a, a good stocking, even, even if we lose some trees to mortality or deer damage. And, and we can even go denser in some cases if we have a lot of deer pressure. So it's a lot of trees per acre, but what it's doing is creating that forest environment very quickly. Uh, with containerized stock, sometimes in some cases we can back off of that a little bit and accept some natural regeneration that floats in. So I mentioned those light seeded species like tulip tree, uh, black cherry, a variety of others that are windblown or wildlife carried can actually come into some sites and uh, kind of build up our tree regeneration numbers. And then we can just do work to thin to favor those trees, maybe containerized trees that we planted that we absolutely want that species there. Uh, but in many cases with, with these conservation plantings, we're talking about hundreds of trees per acre, uh, not tens or, or dozens. So Carrie, when I, I look at um, options, and I, I know I have a lot of these, you know, containerized or versus whatever, um, what questions should I be asking um, the nurseries that I'm working with when I'm, I'm looking at these trees? Well, make sure you have a handle on how big is, you can ask how tall is the tree? 
like you know so this they'll they may say on their form that, that you can find online they may say it's a 10 black walnut and you need to find out how big is that black walnut and that will help you decide do you need to fence it you know, how can I transport it? How big a hole does it need? You might also ask them what the diameter is at the root collar. The root collar is the diameter right above the soil. And that tells you how big the root system is. That's a surrogate for the root system. And so if it's really big, you're gonna have a really big root mass. If, the, if it's a tiny little seedling, it'll have a small root collar and have a small root mass. So ask them how tall the seedling is, ask them how if it's a container, you know, what size container and then think about the logistics of transporting it to the planting site. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid to, if, if but if they use jargon like 1020 just say, you know, Jimmy, it's this is a one year old seedling. That's that's what that means. But do ask them. They, they do want to help you. They want all the nurseries, state and private, want to make sure their customers are happy. And so, but you may need to do spreadsheet and price out so I can get a two year old bare root seedling or I can get maybe a three year old containerized and you may want to put on a spreadsheet what this difference in cost is, what the difference in size is, what your, you know, how big, how deep the holes are, how many you want to put per acre. And so all that goes into your decision making. But call around, call a couple of nurseries and get some estimates on the height of the tree, the size, the cost per tree and make sure they have the species that you're interested in. So Lenny, I think this one's for you. We have another question that just came in. Um, Kat wants to know, how important is weed control uh, for background? She has a field of 500 newly planted small native bare root trees um, and shrubs that they planted in June as a pollinator habitat. Uh, they now have crabgrass that has come into the area but have been told not to worry. Um, should they be concerned? If so, what should, what? action should they take? I agree that crabgrass is not a big concern. It tends to be a late, low stature weed. It's not especially competitive with the trees. Uh, what I think they should consider doing uh, and plan to do next year is next spring, uh, late March to, to April, uh, think about an herbicide application. Uh, and if they don't know how to do good herbicide applications, they may want to contract this. And so oftentimes we're using a combination of what we call pre-emergent herbicides that are active in the soil and prevent weeds from germinating and post-emergent herbicides that will actually kill the weeds that are coming up. The trick is that the rate of application for the pre-emergent herbicides in particular uh, is critical. You put in not enough and you don't get weed control, you put on too much and you damage your, or kill your trees. And so you do need to know what you're doing. With the post-emergent herbicides, the application is also critical because if you uh, hit the weeds and the trees, you've got a chance of killing both. But if you do a, do a good directed spray, you're gonna control the weeds without killing your trees. So if you don't feel confident in doing that yourself, get a hold of your tree planter and see if you can't get them contracted to do a, a follow-up weed control and do that for a couple of years. Uh, I think once you've done that, oftentimes we can back off a little bit uh, the trees have got a little bit of a head of steam, they've got a root system, they've got a fair amount of leaf area, and they can take off and do relatively well. But I, I, I think weed control is critical. All right, as we wrap up, um, Carrie, anything else that we've missed uh, that you want to mention, things that people should be watching for, um, any resources that, that the U.S. Forest Service or that you could give to them? Um, and then Lenny, I know you have some you want to share as well um, as we wrap up um, this planning and resources for conservation tree planting session? Yeah, well, the Ringer site is, has resources. All The state, if you're in Indiana, the state has some resources on tree planting and a state nursery. But also, if you're working with private nurseries, ask them. They often have their own set of resources because they want your business and they want you to be happy. So, uh, you know, if you get online, you find a nursery, you can call them and say, hey, you know, I haven't done this before. Do you have any planning suggestions? They may very well, whether it's a state or a private nursery. So whatever stock type you decide and what nursery you decide to go with, just ask them what they've got. But if you get online, Indiana, DNR has resources for tree planting and I imagine other states do as well. And I'd chime in that uh, we've also got a series uh, for planting and growing fine hardwood uh, trees uh, called the Planting and Care of Fine Hardwoods. It's on the HTIRC site that I think Wendy's got here and can, can share. And we've got several publications that deal with both site preparation, planting, and follow-up care of hardwood seedlings that should be, be helpful as well. 
Great. And if you want to know more about some of the native tree species, Lenny has it. I'm going to give you a great plug here because Lenny, it's it's pretty cool. I have learned a lot. Um, he has an ID that tree series that he does that comes out every Friday on this on our Facebook page here. Um, and you can learn about some of the native trees, where they grow well, how to identify them, um, different things about them that make them really cool. So um, I'll put that link in the in the Facebook comments as well. Um, but it gives you some ideas. Um, as you look at maybe some of the options you didn't know about and maybe even you'll learn about some trees that you didn't know were native to Indiana. I know that's been um, a, an, an eye opener for a lot of people. So thanks for that, Lenny. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, again, wanted to thank both of you, Lenny uh, Farley, Extension Forester and Carrie Pike, um, who's a forest regeneration specialist with the USDA Forest Service. Um, if we didn't answer any of your questions, um, please feel free to leave those in the comment section and we will have uh, these guys um, answer them after the fact. So feel free to go ahead and if you're watching this after the fact, um, go ahead and leave some questions and, and they will get back to you. Um, again, thank both of you. Um, next week, we're back on it. We're talking bats. We're talking about bats on the hardwood ecosystem experiment. Um, a major project, 100 year project we have going on. We've um, talked about birds and salamanders on the HE. We've talked about the general HE project. And this month we're talking bats. And we have uh, Dr. Joy O'Keefe and Liz Belke uh, joining us next week, same time, same channel, three o'clock. Um, so we'll see you then. Thanks, Lenny. Thanks, Carrie. Um, and happy tree planting. <laughs>